Yeah, look at this one here. You are. Hello, oh, yeah. welcome oh, yeah. to the Blackheath History oh, Forum. Yeah. We are very pleased today to have Peter Reid and Dennis Foley with us mm -hmm. um, to talk about their new book. Um, I would like, first of all, though, to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land from which I'm speaking, with the Darug and Gundungara people, because I'm up in the Blue Mountains. I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional elders, past, present and emerging, and to any other Aboriginal people present, including Dennis Foley, one of our speakers today, who is a Gaimara man, um, who is also a professional, professor of management studies at the University of Canberra after multiple other academic appointments. He's been a Fulbright scholar and an Endeavour fellow twice. And he's, his research is very much cross-disciplinary. He's um, involved in literature, history and entrepreneurship with an Indigenous focus. Joining him is Peter Reid, who is an adjunct professor of history at the Australian National University. And I have known Peter for a very long time. And he is always someone who I think of as pushing the boundaries of history in Australia. And he's one of, I think of him as being one of the first people who really put Indigenous voices front and centre in the history discipline in Australia. Um, he's very much led the way. They're here today to talk about their book, What the Colonists Never Knew, the story of Aboriginal Sydney. And this is, um, if you read one book this year, this is the book you've got to read, especially if you live in Sydney, because it will teach you all sorts of things that you really did never know about Sydney, particularly <laughs> if you are not Indigenous. So I would like now to hand over to Peter and Dennis, who will talk for around about 40 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in at any time in the um, comments side of the YouTube screen, and we will deal with them at the end of the talk. So Dennis and Peter, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Kath. Thanks, Kath. Uh, we'd also like to uh, pay our respects to the elders. We're on Ngunnawal country at the moment. So, Gumbadabianga, Gumbadabarangra, Maramarong, Tianaganaga, Maramarong, Bayalia, and Ngunnawal Guri Pimel. And just pay our respects to elders and that's a matter of honor to be able to walk and talk on this country okay i thought we might um we're going to get some questions later on uh so we, we thought we might anticipate a few questions here that need a longer answers and and we thought well okay what what might people want to know about us before we start and i thought uh we thought, well, what we might do then is to then can talk for you know, a few minutes on what what his, his memories were like growing up in sydney um because that's what half the I suppose half the book is is written about since the 1950s, and and I'll talk about my growing up in Sydney partly from you know what we thought and knew and I was told and taught about Indigenous Australia and Indigenous Sydney, and then we might talk about um, what it's like living in Sydney now, how the book's been received, and uh, what the current position is, and then people can ask sort of shorter questions as well. But I suppose we could say that um, Den and I have known each other for about, oh, 20 years plus. Um, and ever since I met him, I thought, right, we're going, we, we're going to have to um, get, get a bit of this story out. So we, we Den produced a story called Repossession of Our, just of our Repossession of Our Spirit. Of our spirit. Mm. And um, that was a very important book and was well received. And I thought, well, we still need to do a bit more. And that's um, a lot more of Dennis's story, not all of it. He's, well, some of it he hasn't told me. Um, but a lot more of the story is uh, contained in this book now. So we'll give, let's Dan, get Dan to kick us off. What was, what was it like then? Actually, Sorry before about. we did, the, the book actually started around a dinner table, several dinner tables, um, but really it was in the Cowan um, on a houseboat. Cowan and Creek it was, yeah. Cowan Creek, yeah, that's when it sort of, it, it, it sort of started, the, the, uh, the fabric of the book started. And it really, it's a, it's a story of growing up. Uh, me growing up as a as a small child, and our family was not unlike a lot of Aboriginal families in Sydney in the fifties. Um, I was um, guarded very closely by my grandmother, and my grandmother lived at Harbord, and uh, and I used to live with her most of the time. And I'd go back and visit my parents who lived in the the housing emission belt of the western suburbs. Mum and Dad went from places like Bass Hill. Well, first of all, they were at I think, Barala, Bass Hill, and uh, Chester Hill, and, um, and and they lived in these horrible fibro um, microwaves, that fibro internal walls, fibro external walls. Anyway, mum and dad 
um, they did it pretty tough. So I used to live with grandma. And, you know, the concept of poverty wasn't uh, a thing that you really knew about because most of the people around you were in the same uh, way. Uh, even though I, I was at Harbord, a lot of the kids at the Harbord primary school were very similar to us. Um, you know, we used to eat a lot of Warrigal greens, uh, which is the Aboriginal spinach, which used to grow, uh, was quite prolific in the around Narrabeen Lake and particularly around um, Curl Curl Lagoon. And, uh, and then you'd pick that, that would be your staple green. And I have a hatred towards chocos. Um, there used to be choco vines everywhere and my nan used to know how to cook chocos in every way that uh, is possible. And she was uh, an absolute marvel at a bit of flour and what she could do with some flour. Mm -hmm. And so just staple foods and we'd eat a lot of seafood, a lot of, sea, um, a lot of shellfish. And uh, we had a great time. And, and the concept of um, gathering food was, you know, we, we, you read these things about the hunter-gatherer. Uh, we weren't hunters and gatherers, but we were fairly subsistence. And, um, yeah, to go down the beach and, and get a, a bag full of uh, yugaris or pippies or some oysters or some other shellfish, some cockles in, uh, in the lake, uh, that, was a, that was our food. Or we'd catch some mullet or we'd, you know, the odd brim. Um, yeah, that, and that was it was great, and we were always doing it. And prawns, Narrabeen Lake, of course, with the uncles, we'd go out and catch the prawns and, and the crabs, and uh, and it was just a, a wonderful childhood. So the childhood, and when you look back at my age now, you look back with probably a lot of um, exotic sort of concepts and thoughts, but because you forget the hunger and you forget the the smells, um, poverty has a smell all of its own, and that's something that I that I hate when I go into doing research and you walk into an impoverished house and you could, it brings back your childhood. But, um, yeah, times were tough. We didn't have much. Um, it was quite interesting. I was 10 years of age uh, when I still was wearing recycled clothes. Now, the downside to that is that I um, didn't have any, any cousins, male cousins, um, that were much older than me. So there was no recycled male clothes. Most of my recycled clothes were actually from my sisters or from my cousins, uh, my female cousins. So I never wore pyjamas until I was a foster. Um, I made a ward of the state. Things like that, I used to wear 90s, and I thought that was what was done. So my school uniform was probably the um, the major piece of um, of clothing that I had, and then a pair of shorts and a, and a couple of T-shirts, that's all. So, um, yeah, but growing up as a child, you're outside, you're in the air, uh, I was a wild eunuch. Um, I was off everywhere. My grandmother had trouble controlling me. Um, I was always in trouble. I was always going somewhere, doing something that I shouldn't have been on my scooter and uh, or trying to find something or, you know, find something that I could use or something other than chocos. Um, so that gives you a sort of a bit of a background. But it was a relatively idyllic life because the areas of um, Manly was a metropolis for us. It was busy. But when you got up to areas like Narrabeen, Narrabeen was very busy at summertime because of the caravan park there. And I think there was two caravan parks there back in the late 50s. But in the early 50s, there was just one caravan park. And that was chock-a-block full of people from the western suburbs holidaying. But places like DY, um, uh, Curl Curl, relatively isolated and not many people. And then Narrabeen Lake itself in the back parts of Narrabeen Lake where our camp was, uh, there was no one just the sand miners because they were mining sand there all the time and trucking it out, pumping out the lake and and um, and they were using that in the building industry of Sydney. But um, that back road, the um, the parkway, that was actually a mining road where the trucks used to trundle up with their sand uh, across a little wooden bridge over Deep Creek and Middle Creek and before they built those substantially large bridges and they just had a, a timber, timber bridge there. And, uh, and that was really isolated country. In fact, I can still remember um, chasing um, the little uh, spotted uh, spotted native cats um, as, a, as a child. I can remember finding a, a, a mother and it's a couple of babies. And uh, we sat, sat there and watched them for so long. And yet, you know, obviously they're, they're extinct now from that area because of cats, uh, domestic cats and dogs um, and trail bark riders um, who were killed just about everything there. Um, but, yeah, there was still emu in the area. There was still kangaroo, or not kangaroo, but wallaby, lots of wallabies. Uh, there was still plenty of goanna, which uh, supplemented the diet occasionally, uh, and lots and lots of possums, um, which um, certainly supplemented our diet. Uh, that was good food for us. So, um, yeah, it was, um, it was uh, school was optional, 
Um, I didn't get much school in my early years. Um, so I, I tried to, every way in the world that, I, that you could get out of school, I'd try it. And invariably, I, I was very fortunate. So, um, but that didn't seem to impede in later life. Um, in fact, it probably helped me, I think. Uh, so, yeah, that gives you an idea of what it was like. But it was a, the countryside there then, most of the roads were still dirt. They uh, There wasn't all that many tarred roads. There was still, the tram lines were still down. In fact, I can still remember the trams being parked. Uh, there's a big shopping centre there now um, in the, in, near um, the lagoon in Queenscliff. Uh, I can remember the big tram shed there and all the trams being parked there. I never saw them run. Uh, they stopped running, I believe, in the war, but I can remember the gas works and I can remember the big gas ball um, at the back of the, what, near the golf course now. And the smell of gas was terrible when you went around those areas, particularly at the gas works in Manly. Um, yeah, I can remember those areas vividly because we went where other people didn't go. Of course, that's when we could be by ourselves uh, without being uh, hassled by uh, the police or by the welfare. So, yeah. Gives you an idea, but it was nowhere near the overpopulated area to what it is today. Um, much more fish, much more bush. Um, it was a, a paradise in so many ways. Pete? Yeah, well, I was, couldn't, be, it couldn't be further apart economically, really. I was a middle-class doctor's son. And as I think back on my education of our Aboriginal people, I'll tell you this funny story. Uh, those of my age might remember the New South Wales School Magazine. I can't remember when it stopped, but there was a story, and I went and looked it up a few years ago. It was said in Arnold Man, it was obviously some, some attempt to bring Aboriginal people into the Australian way of thinking. So you had this a little nuclear Aboriginal family living in Arnold Man in a kind of you know, a little whirly, a little humpy, bark shelter. And every day, Dad goes out humping, hunting, and Mum's at home with the kids. And at five o'clock, Dad comes home again with his, with his bag and dragging a kangaroo trail behind him and this, and this little nuclear family has a very happy time together. It's probably <laughs> just ludicrous as you think about what Alan Land life was actually like. So my education was pretty bloody minimal about Indigenous issues, nothing at all, but really until I got to university and there wasn't much there either, to be perfectly honest. I didn't really learn much about Aboriginal life until I started my well, until I got to the territory in the 70s, started doing some work with the old people there. <clears throat> but I suppose it's true to say that um, we might have been, we've had Aboriginal friends or hung around with them, but it was certainly a racialised, but nobody used that word. I mean, Charlie Perkins got a funny story. And I worked with him once when he was in Adelaide, and he was out with the lads from the uh, St. Francis house. They were all kids taken away from the territory. And this crowd of white kids came past, and they were shouting, let's get the bongs. So Charlie's mates say, yeah, okay, let's get the bombs, whatever they are. And they run along beside the group and, yeah, suddenly whack. Hey, hey, what's happening? Oh, I get it. Oh, I see. Where are the bombs? Right. You've been, you've been, you, and we didn't know whether this separate group or another group would identify us as such. In the book, there's a story by um, a chap called Peter Rodolph. And he says, yeah, I, I was in a gang all that time. This is in the 1960s. And uh, we were fighting the other kids all the time. I didn't realise at the time all the kids in the, in my gang were my brothers, as an uncle, a younger uncle, and a few kids from round about who were actually were relatives. We'd fall an Aboriginal gang and never even realised that we were fighting the other kids who were not Aboriginal. So that was a bit of an introduction. That when he told me that, that what, what Don and like, Don and I like to think of though was, even though I grew up in this comfortable middle class existence, but Dan was hanging around the the old Indigenous waterways. And one of them was uh, Lane Cove, and I spent a lot of time down at Lane Cove, and might have been down there when he was there. And I used to go to Sydney beaches, uh, including DY and uh, Freshwater. And we often think, well, we might have been there at the same time. And one time we could, in particular, although it's not this generation, it's um, generation above, or even really two generations above me. And that is my, my people had a house on my mum's side at. Uh, pretty well on the beach on the southern side of Long Reef, southern end of Long Reef. And Dan's told me later on that's where the old ladies used to uh, used to gather there too. That's where they used to hang out there because Dan will explain that you know, it's, pretty, it's a pretty important place, not far away from Narrabeen. Um, and my, my grandmother 
and her various sisters and relatives, I'm sure, would have sat down on the beach, not very far away from the from the elderly aunties down there, there as well. Never talked to each other, but they might have been sharing the same beach place quite soon, quite quite close to each other. And I like to think that, that our relatives, no, there's no chance they would have ever talked to each other, I'm, I'm afraid, but um, they might have been um, in the same vicinity. Mm. Even, yeah. Um, the funny thing is, I'd even spent some time at Narrabeen. Um, I went to I went to a school called Knox, uh, and they used to run football camps, young training camps for young footballers at Narrabeen, where where the where the Aboriginal camp had been, where Den where Den had been. I left school in '62. By '63, um, I was down there as kind of some kind of football coach, rallying the troops, and. When Den took me there, I said, "Bloody hell, I've been here." I was here, buddy. I mean, Den, we, we went down about nineteen, shit, about um, two thousand or something. Yeah. A long time after that, and when I was there, I, said, I remember being here. And when we did the history, we realised that the, the Narrabeen camp, the Aboriginal camp, had only been demolished only about um, a couple of years before. It was, mm-hmm. was the last? It was even outlasted at Katoomba by, by by a few months. Um, the, the, the the camp at Katoomba. And but the uh, the the camp we don't know what's happened exactly, but it was uh, it was finally cleared with a bulldozer, and Dan will tell you about that if we if you'd like to know. It was finally cleared in about 1959, we think something like that. I said it's only a couple of years later. I was there, I never dreamt of how much history had been going on in this place. I'm sorry to say though, it wouldn't have meant much. It wouldn't have meant all that much to me. And you know, we all study European history and. If the Australian history we study then was all convicts and well, it's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? Gold rushes and <laughs> by the First World War Anzacs and convicts. Aboriginal history hardly came into it at all. Just the melancholy footnote of somebody, some historian wrote. Um, Manning Clark hadn't really started them and even he put his foot in it too by saying civilization didn't didn't begin in Australia until seventeen seventy or whatever day was he gave. So uh, yeah, we've come a long way, have we not? We have, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the um, the stories we were told is in '58 and '59 they came in with bulldozers, and they bulldozed the old camp down in Narrabeen, and um, and we went out there the morning after the last uh, the last bulldozer, or the bulldozer was still there, and um, and the people were had been put into an old it was an old Bedford dump uh, dump truck, and they were driven out to St Mary's and put into a a mission place out at, uh, at, at Rudy Hill, actually. Sorry, not St Mary's, at Rudy Hill. because uh, we went out and visited a few of them and took some food and some clothing out there uh, afterwards. My sister, elder sister, drove out there. So, um, yeah, it was um, yeah, how our entire world uh, collapsed because what was a place of sanctuary and where there was always an elder, where there was always a story, there was always someone to look after you and particularly to take you fishing um, and... Uh, and to get a good feed, uh, it was gone, and there was just an empty hole. And in the in the late fifties, um, I was you know only a small child, and um, yeah, and the shock of that. So it was uh, it was an incredible loss, um, and that I think that loss never has never been overcome. Yeah, you, know, you you lose it, and you you just uh, don't realise. And um, yeah, and and that's one interesting thing, and and. To their credit, the Narrabeen Fitness Camp people um, are trying to uh, recollect a lot of that knowledge so that they can bring it back and they teach the children as the children now come through. In fact, they've got a lot of um, interactions there and they've adopted some of our major uh, skin groups. As um, So when they, the children come in there and they go into their houses for their um, for their programs, they actually adopt the skin groups, which is quite interesting. And they've, um, yeah, and they've yeah. set up a heap of fire pits built to our our um, advice so yeah they, they they bring a lot of the culture in and they take them out on walks and we get them to go up in a couple of the old bora rings and uh, and the kids still get up there and they they see what the bora ring is and um so it, it's good it keeps it alive because narrabeen the word narrabeen actually um a very debatable word but uh, i get asked all the time so i might as well say it narrabeen is actually made up of two words one means blood and one means small person or, or small people and um so it's a narrabeen actually is a place where there is ceremony for young people in the shedding of blood which is the uh, the ceremonial concept so the original word uh, narrabeen um 
is actually is is for um, small people and ceremony because around Narrabeen Lake you have several hills and all those hills are very important in matrimonial law and they're also training sites for young children um, because at, when a child reaches puberty then the males uh, can go off and do men's uh, training male training but until then they all do a similar training which um, you know, Inglesized, it's been called women's law, but it's it's just a standard law, uh, L-O-R-E and L-A-W as well. And so Narrabeen is, is a place for training, and it's interesting that the fitness camp is there and it's still continuing that uh, same concept and same view. So in a way, um, Aboriginal culture lives on, um, but in a different format. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I thought we could... Um, as, as I was... Growing, I was gradually learning more and more. But once I um, met Dan, I was up at the University of uh, Queensland. We had lunch together. And we talked more and more about our common memories. I thought, oh, wow, this is. And I was writing a book called uh, Belonging at the time. Yeah. And uh, we thought, okay, well, I said to Dan, do, do you want to come down? Um, we'll meet you at the airport and we'll spend a couple of days driving around the country you're talking about, which and we did. And then we certainly went to Narrabeen, went down to Manly and a lot of other places. Then was telling me the traditional stories from all around there. Stories you heard, not just traditional stories, but these are stories told by my grandma. And we tried to incorporate them in the book. Uh, you'll see that uh, if, you, if you check the book out, you can see that every chapter has uh, begins with... Uh, 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 most most of the chapters anyway begin with, with a, a traditional story. Uh, we'll, we'll, where's that chapter? It's chapter five. We're going to the beginning of chapter five. Um, first of all, um, there's a, there's, we're trying to have another because it was published through the National Museum of Australia. We thought, well, we should be artifactual. So you know that chapter there. That's a, a bottle, but the, you know, if you can see it there, it's on page uh, one hundred and fifty-eight, um, and. So there's an artifact for, for every story. And just before that, there's um, a story that in this case is called The Man with a Striped, the Striped Shark, and it's set at Fairlife Beach. And I think that's that, what, what struck me is uh, the, essential, the essential element which makes it so exciting to me of Dennis's stories, they're all set in actual places. You know, this is not like the Mary Graham, Mary Graham Bruce's story that I was raised on, the, uh, that book called... Um, don't actually bulk them up. You know, that's the same kind of stories, but they're all absolutely place-based. They refer to the places, and you know, often there's a, there's a, a, an important story to be derived from from this place. And Dan told me a lot of stories, and each a lot of them are each one the beginning of each chapter. We recorded them and um, and put them in the book with an artifact from from um, uh, from generally from associated with the area. There's, there's, there's a lot of fishing rods been in the family for a long time because fishing is so important. Um, there's, um, uh, there's an Aboriginal uh, net that came out with the British Museum exhibition a couple of years ago. There's a photograph of that there. So a variety of artefacts. Again, the, the important thing about Aboriginality is the locality. You, know, you, you can't really tell the stories of country until you're on the country yourself. That's what I've learned over the years. So we tried to make the book an absolutely Aboriginal book much as it could possibly be, by having by tying the individual stories to individual places and by having an artifact associated with that. Um, and as soon as you get away from that, well, uh, so much of the power of the stories has been lost. But if once while it's there, well, it just it just keeps on. Um, you you realise. Um, oh, I came I came to realise that we can so much of the country to celebrate because we've got stories. Not just about Sydney. We've got a story about DY Beach. We've got a story about Long Reef. We've got a story about um, Middle, uh, Middle Harbour, and an actual story of, of how this came, how the place came to be, or why a certain um, ancestor uh, or a certain um, evil spirit happened to be created at this spot. And that's to me the exciting part. It's 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 not just a Sydney of Sydney in general. And we, we still haven't got there yet. You know, if you go to the Opera House and walk around and oh, the Opera House officials say, oh, aren't we good, you know? We've got all these Aboriginal plaques in there. But who are they? They're all, you know, uh, Udra and Nunakle, for instance. Okay, she's there. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's lovely. Um, that's, that, that, there's, so, there's so many Indigenous people from all over Australia are celebrated there. You walk along there and say, where, where are the Sydney people being celebrated in the Sydney Opera House? Where are they? 
Now, I suppose they could say we didn't do any better now, but what we do now? There's no excuse, in my opinion, not to start really celebrating the indigenous, not just indigenousness in Australia, but Sydney indigenousness in Sydney. Now, that's why we got. That's the next stage to get to. Mm. What do you reckon, Dan? Yeah, only that's pretty contentious. Only Kath, only Kath Walker would be. Uh, she'd be furious, I think. Uh, she's a lovely old lady. I was lucky I knew her before she passed. Um, yeah, and one of the things about the book that, for those of you who may not have read it uh, or have seen it, um, Peter is the mullet. He's the um, he's the voice coming in. So you'll see an image of a mullet, and where you see the image of the raven, that's actually my voice. And uh, my skin skin line is raven. I come from a matrilineal society, as we said before. And um, my mother's a silver crested cockatoo. I'm a raven. And um, and my mother, if she was alive, she'd be telling you I'm raven mad. But that's another story. And um, but the, the book is in the front part of the book. It takes a little while to sort of get going because it's a it's a it's a complicated concept to get to sort of start. So the front of the book, the start of the book, I, I think. Um, I don't think it could have been any better, but it sort of it it gets it's a little bit complicated. But once it gets going, it just it's a, a well-oiled machine, and and you you have the comment of the raven, and then then the comment of the mullet, and you have the the indigenous and the colonial views coming across, and the and the, the inter interaction. But just getting back to our stories, all of our stories are about um, it's not about if it happened. And it's not so much about where it happened, although that's very important for us, because like in the at Fairlight, the story there is a man called Banu, and he's a man that we highly regard, and he's a he's a man that was once a great warrior, and he saved a lot of children from being attacked from a tiger shark, and um, and that's the that's his story. So his name lives on, and this this concept of the word Banu, and Banu means when there is a setting sun in summertime. And the reflection of the red comes on the water. That's actually the reflection of his blood in the water. And so it gives a moral. So when you're sitting down with a small child and you're trying to get a child to understand when I call for you to come back in and you tell the story about this man saving the shark and the shark attacking him and eating his legs off, um, then it's it's vivid reality. And so with our, our stories, there's actual morals. And I must admit, sorry, I, I was a bit cheeky. I was looking through the book a minute ago because every time I open it up, I love looking at images of um, my family uh, because I don't look at them enough. And and we don't, you know, my aunties and my mum and my mum is a young girl and, um, yeah, my uncles. It's, uh, every time I open the book, I always get a buzz by seeing them. Um, so I was, that's what I was doing when Peter was talking, sorry, if I appeared to be rude. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it's what So our stories are, are morals. But they're stories that we believe actually happened, and um, and yes, they are place um, place centric. Um, we have a story of um, of the brown snake and uh, and Nagari. Nagari is the moon, and that story actually is based on the northern side of Long Reef at uh, Cor at the start of Coroy Beach, where there's a reef of red rocks, and there's always a pile of seaweed there. And there's always some kelp builds up, and in our stories, that's actually a pile of rotting. Um, rotting fish now that story was originally told when the shoreline was five days walk to the east so that's a sure that's a story that's actually moved back as the shoreline has moved back so that is the place where it's told but the original story was told when the um on the edge of the uh, continental shelf so yeah we know that um but we still tell the story there at Colleroy. so uh, the concept of place and and that but the moral has never changed the moral be hidden, with, hidden within the story. And that story, one of the things you've got to understand too, that when you look at a rock engraving or you look at one of our stories, that story, when it's told to a four-year-old, is slightly different, or the rock engraving, when it's interpreted to a four-year-old, is different to when it's told to an eight-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 24-year-old, and a 40-year-old. Um, same story, same rock engraving, but there's a different layer of knowledge that's built into it every time. And that's one of the interesting things about our work, that you get these non-Indigenous experts or Indigenous experts um, who come in and then they redefine and retell us about who we are and what we are. Um, and hopefully the book has gone to some way to dispel some of those myths. Yeah. We haven't been able to um, get out in the, in, in the waterways for the last couple of years because of COVID, but that's the most exciting time that we can spend with our families 
then the family and me and my family and we hire a boat and got little tinny and buzz around everywhere and and uh start exploring wherever we start exploring there's something to be discovered uh if, if, if this, is, this is my last words in the book it talks about talks about that that this is what we say oh i say but this is uh so it then said this is uh when you'll find me talking it's got the um the mullet in front of it. That part of Dennis' sandstone country within the Karingai Chase National Park remains particularly rich, though the sites need a lot of energy, understanding and imagination to find and read them. In a single week in January 2019, we haven't been back since really, on our daily expeditions into the country around Refuge Bay, we were tied up in the houseboat, hopping the little tinny and go to another place there, some roundabout, led and interpreted by Dennis, we discovered an imposing engraving hidden deep in the eastern arm of the bay, that's American Bay, signaling that males might not pass that point. But hidden in the scrub, people pass it a million times a day in their boats. It's only probably 50 metres of the crow flies, hard to get to those. Above Castle Lagoon grew a young Angophora, exuding sap and in full flower, standing ready to grant fertility to the young women who'd never come back to her. Look at the way the shells were arranged in a certain way in the big cave above Cowan Point. Obviously, that's significant, General Oates, but unfortunately, I didn't have the knowledge to interpret them. At the southern end of the cave, this is um, if you know, a bit difficult if you know, know that country. But just imagine if you know um, Cowan Creek around Pitwater. Imagine a cave there. Well, at the end of this cave, there's a foot walk track leading uphill, leading over to Narrabeen, half a day's walk away. Then we visited a midden, Shell Midden in America Bay. Much eroded in 10 years, where Dan found that rum bottle we saw a picture of just now in 2009. It's nice that my people were still living here 100 years ago, he says, after the British arrived, but the use of alcohol makes me sad. The physical past is everywhere, but in the end it'll surely vanish. And these are the wise words of um, the Bunurong historian, Bruce Pascoe. He says this, The only thing of real value that we can leave to our children, apart from our love, is the truth about their inheritance. We must tell them the story of both victor and vanquished, because in time, it's soon forgotten which was which. The only, only thing children find significant are the deeds of their mothers and fathers and what made them love each other. So that's my last words in the book. Dan gets another go, of course, because the notes, the book is, is his words, really. Um, do you want to add some last words? Um, actually, I'd love to go back to that cave. One of the things that that cave, I had never found that cave before um, because we'd gone searching for it several times. Yeah, and we have. and yeah. it this, how can a massive big cave, we know where it is, um, been there as a child, uh, Peter's been there many times, how can a cave disappear? Anyway, yes, it disappeared for several years. We, we had some detailed uh, trips there in the past. And uh, all this, But when I found it, what was really exciting and what got me very teary was not only were the shells placed in a certain way, it was the first and only cave I've ever come across in Sydney where the scientists, the anthropologists and the archaeologists and whatever archaeologists hadn't dug up. Um, this cave was still intact. It, its integrity was still intact. Um, so therefore, the, the sleeping places were still there. Um, yes, a lot of the a lot of the midden had been eroded by successive rainfall over over years, but you could still see the areas, the camping areas where um, where people had camped, where they'd had their lean-tos, um, and and where the cooking area had been, where the men's area of sleep, because the men and the women would sleep in different areas, all as if our mob just left it, the, the, you know, a month before. Um, uh, give and take a bit of wear and tear. That's what was so exciting about it. And not only was there a track that went over to Narrabeen, which followed along um, up, there was also another track which we took up, which went to a, a really important um, ceremonial site. And, um, and, and yeah, there was a couple of really interesting things. But that, that um, Peter mentioned about that engraving um, that was just in the headland, it was so deep you could actually fit your hand almost up to your thumb inside the engraving where it had been dug into the sandstone to form this beautiful shape, which is a, a shape which means, um, you know, no men pass this site. 
Um, and it was, yeah, to see one so big and so so dramatically uh, well hewn out, you know, uh, that was an incredible thing because that would have taken a, not only a lot of work, um, a lot of labour, but it was done for a very specific reason. So it was a real marker. Um, and we, we stumbled on it, and we stumbled on it almost walking up a cliff. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was just, um, just brilliant. But um, I think... Actually, I had never read the epilogue until this afternoon, uh, even though we've done many book launches and, and things. Um, yeah, I think one of the interesting things about how we've left the book and how I've left the book is the concept of colonialism in the 21st century. Um, in, when the book came out in 2020, August 2020, the concepts of colonial power is not so much amongst the non-Indigenous population, it's the colonial interaction of uh, Aboriginal groups and um, one of my um, distant cousins he summed it up perfectly how we've been um, we've been co colonized twice once by the British and another time by the non-indigenous and it's this lateral violence that we're experiencing which yeah, I, the um, indigenous you mean yeah, yeah from yeah, the yeah, indigenous yeah, 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 yeah. from uh, from the people you know like we get told and I get told all the time by people who come from yeah their forefathers came from Moree or they because we know the families yeah, they came from Cowra or Moree or Wellington or wherever, and um, and and they tell us they tell us that oh, what you're talking about is wrong, you know. Well, hang on, go back. I don't tell you what to do in Moree or or Cowra, you know. I would never tell your parents. How dare you tell me that in Sydney? But because they've got a title of a heritage officer or a land council, they seem to think they've got some sort of statutory right to do this over us and. And so the, the concept of colonisation is very real, it's very destructive, and it is really impacting on our youth. Um, just uh, recently we lost um, one of our last language speakers, uh, a young man who was also an actor. Um, he was a bit of a rogue. He was a very close friend of mine. I grew up with him. And, um, yeah, it was, it was sad to see him, but the torment that he'd gone through in his life, uh, because he was uh, a vivid um and a very, very uh, in-your-face person. Uh, he suffered from a little bit of mental illness, but he was a language speaker. He was a national treasure, and yet he was continually pulled down by um, people, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah, because of his originality, which was mm -hmm. quite, quite sad. Yeah, is that your phone? Mm -hmm. uh, no, that's it. Thank you. Here, and oh. you, can you, could you hear that? Yeah. 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 All right. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I think we've just about used up our time now. Yeah. Just uh, one one last point I'd make though, which is about the book itself. You know, it, 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 the critics say, "Oh, is that, is that Australian critics have to conservative a lot." They say, "Oh, this is a peculiar book. I don't know what to make of it. Is it a biography or an autobiography? And I can't follow what's going on here. Um, is it?" But I say, "Oh, well, yeah, get over it, people. Read what's in here." It's not all that strange in the layout. Most of my books, anyway, are all a bit peculiar in one way or another. Um, but this, I, I, I say, PSE students, when they come into me and they say, "Look, I want to, work, I want to work in this country." Okay, who do you know in that country? Oh, I don't know. Well, you better go and find somebody. I'm, I'm certainly not going to supervise anybody who's working in any part of Aboriginal Australia without going to get to know the community first. Not just to say, "Can I? Can I do it?" Although that's important. But just, how can you possibly work with people? None of us, in my opinion, in Aboriginal Australia today, people like me, non-Indigenous people, should be working in a community unless we're working in collaboration. Then we shouldn't be doing it. And that's why you say, well, you know, Dennis was too busy to write a book by, my, or by himself. I've got some abilities to record and transcribe and that kind of stuff. Let's work together. That's the way it should be. I think that's the way we, 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 we ought to be working these days. And I'm... And I'm Kind of proud that Dan and I have had a, made, always maintained a good relationship. Um, we we stick with each other. I'm, I'm a strong defender of Gamalawa country against all comers, and uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. we we don't get we don't get, we don't get, we don't get a lot of friends from doing that. But <laughs> that's the way you got to go. I, I think it, actually, who was the lady that did the book launch at the museum? Uh, um, Heather Goodall. No, no, no. The uh, the, the uh, Aboriginal lady. Oh. Oh, uh, um, you meant all oh, the museum? Yeah, oh. the museum. Yeah, um, oh, here we are. Two old men. We oh, can't remember things. Mean, um, uh, yeah, the artist. Uh, you know, she's 
the curator at the National Museum. Oh, Margot. Margot. Margot Neal. Margot, Margot Neal. Neal. Yeah. The lovely Mar Margot. Margot Neal has said, because, yeah, there's been, a, you know, you always get people who try and uh, stratify and, and objectify anything you write. It's not a, it's not supposed to be a bibliography or an autobiography. It's not, nothing like that at all. This is a story. Um, and it's a contemporary history story. It's it's about sociology. It's about all sorts of things. Margot Neal said that when she read it, she was taken back because she, she said, we hear this word reconciliation. All the, and and we, we hadn't picked up, we didn't think about this at the time. And she said, we hear this word reconciliation all the time. And she said, this book is reconciliation. It's, it's where you've moulded Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous concepts and Indigenous history, and you've moulded it with the colonial history. Um, so you've got the colonial and the, um, and the Aboriginal hand in hand as one. One is not greater than the other. One is not judging the other. But it is, it's reconciliation. And, um, yeah, we were, I was very touched by that. I thought that was probably one of the nicest things that's yeah. ever been said yeah. to me. Yeah. Yeah. Got to love yeah. it, Margo. Got on, on, on your Margo. Yeah. 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 Well, we're just about at 22. Um, Kath, do you want to throw it to the floor or something? Fabulous. Well, there is um, a few comments and questions coming through. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And um, I have I have lots of thoughts. I was I was fascinated that the thing you ended on reconciliation. What um, Margot Neal said. That's amazing. That is sums it up. Because I was trying to think about whether I thought about the book as a biography or autobiography, and I actually didn't. I just thought about it as as something that was yeah. I don't know. Yeah. This there you come. Maybe. Yeah. Um, thought, um, musings, politics. There's a lot of politics in there, of, yeah. um, and I can I can see why. Yeah, it's it's fascinating. It was so. I thought reconciliation is a, is a very good reconciliation at work. So yeah. um, I have a few comments from people. Um, Karen Baxter says that it is um, rather like um, her life. She said this right when you started. Sounds like life with my grandfather as a small kid, fishing, hunting, collecting berries and bush foods with a garden in the backyard. And she wants to know how she can get an autographed copy. And I have to say that you're both in Canberra, so she needs to get herself to Canberra, I think, is probably we the answer. Post it down here. We can sign it, I suppose. That's yeah. another way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. So anyway, but we can, we can, if Karen would like to get in touch with us, we will put her in touch with you. Okay. Um, um, Eva Johnston talks about um is reflecting on the important heritage sites that we don't that we um don't generally that are not generally known but are located in traditional owners memories and she's saying that they must not be destroyed through ignorance for example she's talking about raising the warragamba wall dam mm. might be some sort of desecration would would you like to comment on that at all oh look um actually when i was a young boy i um, i was involved in the army and we, um, and I had another young chap, we had to do a survival course in the back country of, uh, of the Warragamba area, a part of the area which is going to be flooded now. And um, obviously the dam was in existence in those days. And sorry, the dogs are fighting next door, um, including mine. And um, if you can hear dogs barking in the background. And anyway, to cut a long story short, there was four of us in a survival team and two of us were Aboriginal. And we went through country that just blew our mind. Uh, the things we saw on the ground, the artifacts, the um, the trees, the 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 sites, um, you know, and you know, it was really funny because we we did a couple of smokings for ourselves, and as soon as we did a smoking for ourselves, and these two white guys, they had no idea what we we're on about. Bang! Uh, uh, this um, suicidal uh, wallaby just hopped out to us where we could we could hit it and and kill it. And we we laughed and said that wasn't a suicidal wallaby. That was a gift from the old people saying thank you. That country is so important. Surely they could put it. I hate putting dams up anyway because it always floods something and kills someone's property. But um, surely that, you know, we can look at protecting this country. So, yeah, Eva, you're spot on. Um, that the proposal, what they're doing, there is a, a, a fairly active movement on at the moment to try and curtail it. Or to look at it, but yeah, it's going to destroy amazing sites that we just have never been mapped properly and, and just out there. It's what the colonists doesn't know because they never asked. They've never gone out and asked those people. You know, even there's a story up there in that country actually of the creation of the um, of the platypus. Now, there's the platypus creation story comes from up near from the inland sea. It also comes from Moree, 
but there's also one that comes from down there, a little bit different from the other ones. But you know, there's those creation stories. You know, they, this this is Australia's history. You know, you, you flood it, you get rid of it, it's gone. You know, um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, sorry. You can sorry. see what's lost there. You can see, you know, there's a famous place called Gorongacha's Waterhole, which was flooded in the Borogamba Dam. And even today, if the water would let you out there, you can float in the boat there in the middle of Warragamba Dam and suddenly using a reco sounder, sounder it, you suddenly find it's 10 metres deeper above where you are and you go along for 30 metres and it, it, isn't, it isn't there anymore. So you know, we just passed Gorongacha's water hole. Very sacred spot, very familiar with Indigenous people throughout, or oh, a fair bit of oh, all the Sydney imprint. And that's just an example of what, what's lost. Dan's talking about what isn't lost on the other side, mm. just upstream. Yeah, so, yeah. So, Eva, yeah, please yeah. get out there and yeah. try and save it. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so we have um, Lindy Batterham from Castle Craig is saying um, thank you for the talk, and she was she was wondering why it was not called Gaimara, Gaimaragal Council anymore. Gaimaragal country by the council. You might like to comment on that. And she's also suggesting that we could, that um, they want to get you back on country to talk to people. So, uh, you want to comment about now that? COVID, yeah, now that COVID's over, yeah, I'm, I try and get up there all the time. I do a lot of work with the schools. Um, the naming of sites is very political. Um, you have very hostile land councils who have no traditional owners. And I don't want to comment too much because I'll end up in court. But uh, they have their own agenda, which is usually around about it's about money, because they uh, they get land back uh, and they sell it off. They're all about real estate. Uh, they're not about Aboriginal heritage, even though they may say that. Then you have heritage advisors with the local councils, who are all about their self existence, uh, and they're not about dealing with Aboriginal people. They're they're um, they're these experts that come in and, and do so. The, the naming of sites, the naming of areas, um, yeah. We did have one small win in the um, the uh, privately owned national park at Narrabeen. They did call it Gamaragal. But um, every now and again, the mayor of Warringah is on side. He's looking at it. National Parks and Wildlife, they, they're on side. They always make sure they run stuff past either myself or other family members or other members in the community um, who are traditional owners. So, uh, yeah, to give you an illustration, um, I'm going off track a little bit, there was a, a, a walkway up on um, North Head on Karangal, which is a very sacred site, and they the National Parks wanted to call it Bandicoot Walkway. Anyway, um, they got this advice off these um, heritage experts, and it basically meant someone who... Um, who uh, performed filetto on a male appendage. Um, that's what it, what this word meant. So when they ran the word past me, I burst into laughter. And then I gave them the real name for the bandicoot. Uh, if they ha and, and it had got right up to the minister that it was going to be called this name. And this, oh, it's, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking what goes on. So, yes, uh, let's hope one day common sense will prevail and we'll get a lot more. Um, acceptance of old names. So, yeah, but I look forward to getting back there, Lindy. Okay, so um, I have I have a question for, for Peter um, because the book is very much Dennis talking about stuff and talking about his experience and then Peter comes in with, with other stories and background and context and that sort of thing. And I wondered whether, Peter, you saw your role as providing different examples of different experiences from Dennis's or from providing at all to provide examples that backed up what Dennis was saying. Yeah, or something or something I didn't actually, yeah. Um, yeah, very much so. It's it's mine's a, mine's a contextual role. And I got all that information from um, when I worked at Sydney Uni and the ARC, Australian Research Council, and we had about uh, seven years really to research the history of Sydney. Um, and I decided not to do a giant book. We're going to do a website instead. And that website's still there. It's called History of Aboriginal Sydney, all one word, stop edu, stop au. And in there, there's a huge amount of information, including 330 odd video interviews with Indigenous people. Um, there's, I think, there's, I don't think there's, a, there's a non Indigenous face is not there in the whole in the whole thing. Um, and so I had a lot of contextual information um, to add in to see to, to to work out what's happening. I mean, it's it's all context. I mean. 
narrowband is resumed in 1959, but it lasted until then. Well, um, around Dolls Point, you know, Cogra Bay, that lasted till about 1880 before the people there got shoved off. So they were lucky, actually. The premier, the, the man who became the premier was um, uh, the local landowner, and he was a passionate supporter of Aboriginal people. He let the camp stay there. But he, he eventually left um, there and went in to live in, uh, in the centre city when he became premier. It took too long to get out there on the tram. And immediately, the next person that moved in, right, we'll get all those black fellas off here now, and they finished up at, at uh, La Perouse or some other place. Mm. So that's what happened. And so there's always context. Okay, the Gamaraville people are lucky. They last a bit longer than others. But Dennis's family, because some of them went over the mountains near to Wollongong, and they spent a bit of time there. Well, they were, in some ways, they were the lucky ones. They were, made, they were able to remain entrepreneurs. Though, if, if you started a family company down here, you were really lucky to survive more than a generation. So context, 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 context. There's a number of uh, other people who come into the book. They're in, in, important people. Um, uh, and the Indigenous people, that is, who come into the story. Um, but we, we, we weren't just looking for the big names either. We was trying to work all around Sydney uh, and get some Dar the Garrick stories. How, how, what were Darek people doing at the same time as, as Dennis's family or Gamaragal? Stories. So it's contextual, yeah, and I've tried to use all the information, which, as I said, you can still go and find. You can, If you look up the website now, you can find a lot of stories from Den and a lot of stories from great many other people in Sydney as well. Thank you. Um, so we've got a few comments coming through basically saying that they really want to read the book and they're wondering where the book can be purchased, and I would have to say Glee Books has got it in Blackheath, um, but probably every other good bookstore. But we would, um, Blackheath History Forum gets supported by Glee Books in Blackheath, so we would encourage you to go and visit them because now we're open. It's open. You can actually go in. It's so exciting. Um, if anybody does want to contact Dennis or Peter, then they can just email the Blackheath History Forum and we will forward the emails on. Um, and Cherry is saying that um, she grew up above Grotto Point and appreciated reading about your family experiences and stories, and she really liked the juxtaposition structure. Um, definitely reconciliatory. And it does it does work, work extremely well. Um, now, I wanted to ask something of Dennis about... Um, and it goes to it goes to his family being one of the lucky ones, and in particular you being one of the lucky ones. Because when you were talking, you were saying how you didn't go to school very often when you were a kid, and mm -hmm. and it probably didn't harm you. But I notice in the book one of the things you say is when you get to secondary school, you get to stay at school because the principal comes up to you and says, "Pretend you're not Aboriginal, and you can pass as white." And the reason for that, and I didn't. I didn't know this. I was quite stunned by this. Was that basically when an Aboriginal child reached the age of fifteen, they could be excluded from public school in the nineteen fifties and sixties, whether or not they wanted to go. But you pretended you were white and you stayed on. And I wondered if you could reflect on what sort of privilege that gave you, being able to do that, and whether you thought that that education was more beneficial or just as beneficial, or whether you got equal amount of support from the fact that you're really connected to your Indigenous grandmother. And so, yeah. therefore, you know, you had both. You, you, yeah. you were one of the ones because you had both. Yeah, well, Nan was gone by then, um, but I still had one of Mum's brothers. And um, Mr Quinlan was a wonderful man. He was he was the the epitome of the stereotype of the, of the Aboriginal mid middle-aged man, a hopeless alcoholic, uh, but he was not Indigenous. Um, but Mr. Quinlan had a, um, he was a lovely man. Um, he let us kids get away with murder so many times. And we had a great bunch. Uh, the faculty were fantastic too. Like I remember one time I was accidentally caught in a um, in a stolen car, I was joyriding. I didn't know it was stolen. But anyway, off we all go to children's court. Three of my teachers turned up. In, mum and dad were too frightened to go there. And plus dad had to work. No, dad was in hospital. Dad, dad was had cancer. He was in hospital. Mum had no way of getting to children's court. Three of my teachers rolled up to children's court, but there was an agenda. Our school, we had the highest graduation in year 12 of Aboriginal students, probably still today in a Western suburb school. But we had an agenda because the Aboriginal kids, we made up the swim team. We made up the water polo team. We made up the, the best rugby league team in the Western suburbs in Sydney, the best girls hockey team, the best basketball team, netball team. 
And on it went. Westfields High School is now a sports school. It was built on the back of outstanding Aboriginal um, athletes. And in, the, in, in that process, those teachers did their best to give us an academic training as well. Um, so, yeah, we were, we were really fortunate. We were, we were amongst a group of left-wing, um, social-orientated people, but they wanted sport, and, and we provided it. We were the, you know, at, uh, good on them. They gave me an opportunity and, uh, and all the rest. Yeah, you know, I look at some of the kids around me. Now, the sad part is a lot of those kids that I went to school with have since passed. They've passed it passed on very early, but um, boy, we, you know, in that year, my year, half a dozen of our kids got into uni, um, and that was, you know, in 1972, an average of kid into uni, it was almost unheard of, um, but they got in, and yeah, they got teacher scholarships, they got all sorts of things, and that was because of these fantastic teachers that we had, but Mr Quinlan, yeah, look, he had an agenda, and he did it well, and he, for those of us that did the right thing by him, he did the right thing by us, and he was amazing. Yeah, um, he was a saint. Yeah, and like I said, yeah, we if we were, and it was really funny because you get all these kids, and we're, some of the kids were bright red head. Uh, most of us were fair. There was a few real dark kids, and we got a group of about forty kids, and we're all put together at the back of the admin building. And he says, "Right, I know you're all Aboriginal. You're not allowed to associate with each other." Yeah, right. We just found out who our uh, peer group was and who our support group was, and it was, and that's how it worked. That's how we got through. We supported each other all the way through. A lot of the guys left when they were 15, 16, did apprenticeships, and same with the girls. Um, you know, they got in the family way and things. But uh, those of us that stayed on, yeah, it was just fantastic. And it, and it was a different thing. We didn't have racism at our school because even the white kids um, knew that we were Aboriginal, but we worked together uh, because of sport. And, uh, and I think that was a big equaliser. Yeah. So well, everyone loves the rugby players and the cricket team and the sports teams. You know that the, the you know it doesn't matter what oh, school you're in. It's the yeah. it's the way yeah. to yeah yeah get people together. So. Yeah, we said so, a, a group of nerds at school, and and these guys were Polish uh, immigrants. They came from all sorts of countries around Europe. Yeah, they were first generation or or, um, or second generation Australian. They were all immigrant kids, but they were bright. And they w had no physical capabilities at all. They used to help us with our homework. And, and it was just a brilliant connection we had. We would help them stop them getting bullied by the other kids. And then we would, uh, uh, I don't forget one time we had this cross country. And all of us, we vowed we would not finish the cross country until every one of those kids came through with us. Mm -hmm. And our year, instead of this cross country where these kids would fall in the water and you know, we we came through as a bunch, and we helped each other come through. You know, we did. We were we were different. Uh, we were great. We looked out for each other. We had to, because you know, um, yeah, otherwise the cops were hanging around, looking to grab us or welfare. You know, and uh, yeah, and we just yeah, it was great. We had a wonderful school, a wonderful school life. Yeah, it's amazing what a difference a good school can make. Oh, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be Knox, does it, Peter? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Mm. <laughs> Um, um, we don't have any more questions and we're coming up for the hour so I think I might close it off there and say thank you very much to Dennis and Peter is there anything that either of you would like to finish off by saying wait for the next book <laughs> <laughs> well I should say you should all go out and buy this book Preferably yep. from ebooks, books of course. Um, and yeah. then um, we can, if you want to get in touch with Dennis and Peter, um, we can certainly facilitate that. All right. Thank you. Thanks for being on the show, Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Right. And then 